morning, and I'm going to ask for more flexibility throughout the morning. It's given everything that's on our plate between now and Friday, given crossover is approaching. Um, in reviewing the agenda last night, uh, I've determined that we're going to get more done and more productively by doing some things differently than what's laid out on the agenda. So let me walk through that and let people know what we're, what we're doing this morning. Um, so we are going to, we will be hearing from uh, Barbara. Uh, there, thank you, sorry. I don't call me very nice people immediately. Apologies. No one should take it personally. I, it's something kind of better for me. For me. Uh, so we, we will be hearing from uh, Barbara Prine about the about some high tech nursing issues, and then uh, and there may be someone else to comment on that as well. I'm going to have Lori take charge of that. Uh, Emily Brown is with us. Emily. Okay. Yep. Oh, there you are. Sorry, you're behind David. <laughs> David, I couldn't see. You. Uh, we'll hear from Emily, and then. Um, and I don't believe at this point. And then, uh, and then when we're finished with that, we'll be taking a break uh, until 10:30. At 10:30 or at 10 o'clock, uh, or when we take the break, uh, Representative Donahue. Uh, we have an affordability work group that's been doing some work and is on the agenda. Uh, but what I've determined, or what we've determined together, is the, the next best thing is for that group to be able to do some further conversation amongst itself rather than trying to do something with the whole committee at this point. And so uh, that group will be meeting uh, during that period of time. At 10.30, we will come back to our agenda item on prior authorization. And we have a number of witnesses scheduled at 10.30. So we'll be hearing those witnesses at 10.30. And my understanding is that that should be fairly uh, clear as to where we are with that. And my, my hope, just I'll put it out, my hope is that we will finish that testimony um, roughly around 11. Um, and that um, then at 11, we will again break from the whole committee and we're going to divide into some other work groups. We have a number of other pieces that work and need to get uh, worked on with our legislative council who's going to be available to us. Uh, the workforce group has some continued work that you were working on and some finalizing some language there. So there will be time this morning to do some more work on that. Uh, and Representative Donahue has offered to help assist with some of that if that's helpful. Um, and then in anticipation of tomorrow, uh, numbers of us are going to be redeployed to other tasks. Uh, to get ready for some other language around some uh, prescription drug issues and some other remaining miscellaneous health care issues that uh, remain on our agenda. I think we'll find out way to board everything by the end of the day on Friday for crossover, but I think this will help us move things forward. Um, so with that, I think we'll then start and we'll hear from Barbara Prime and the uh, the context of this is that we have, we came across a number of different issues in the course of our testimony uh, since January. <coughs> issues that we believe either should be put into statute as a statutory change, or should put into session law to help clarify uh, some issues that we want more information on or where we're asking for there to be something to take place. And we're going to be putting that together in a committee bill, uh, a miscellaneous health care bill, which I've, I mentioned in this room before. Uh, and uh, this, this may be something that yeah. we, we can include in that in that context. And if I can just add, yeah, and if I could just add, because this is an issue that actually hasn't come before the committee yet. Um, it is something that I was approached on um, in the hallway, but it's also an issue that came up in appropriations when I was sitting in on some of the budget discussions early on. And so um, I agreed to say, let's put some language forth. Jen, this is language um, that Barbara will walk us through. Jen has not you know, really looked at it or done anything with it. And I apologize because I did not get it to some of the other stakeholders in advance. So I apologize for that. So we'll take a couple minutes and have Barb walk us through what this is. 
and then hear from um, Joelson for a couple minutes, and then we can take it off at, at a later date, have a committee discussion about where we are. Hi, I'm Barbara Prine. I'm a staff attorney at the Disability Law Project of Vermont Legal Aid, and I represent individuals with disabilities and severe medical conditions um, in the legal issues that arise out of their disabilities. I've been doing this work for about 23 years. Um, for several years now, two, three years now, we've been hearing from families who have family members with very complex medical needs. And these are people who, in 10 years ago, 15 years ago, would have been living their lives in hospitals, but they're now being served at home with the help of a lot of um, work by the families and home health nurses. So these are people with high medical needs and they're medically fragile people. They need nursing care often or for long periods of time. It's different than, um, you know, your, what we think of more as home health, more traditional home health, which is for shorter periods of time or for periods of recovery. Vermont has programs through the Department of Vermont Health Access, through Dale, and through uh, the Department of Health, where a nurse assessor comes out assesses the person's medical need and says this person needs 40 hours a week of medical care, this person needs 80 hours a week of medical care in home. Um, and so that's then awarded through the Medicaid program as medically necessary care. But what's been happening for years now is that only about a half of that care is actually being provided. And so that puts tremendous strains on families who can't sleep because they have to intubate their child in the middle of the night or can't go to work because they have to put the feeding tube in or have to use the compression chest or whatever it is that those families need. And so it, and like we talked to one family where their doctor says if their child gets sick <clears throat> for more than two days in a row because they don't have overnight care, they have to put her in the hospital because it's unsafe if the parents fall asleep by accident um, because their child could die. So it, the, the repercussions of the shortage is more expensive hospital care. It's also people leaving the workforce and it's also tremendous stress on families. Um, so we've been meeting with um, the Agency of Human Services for a year uh, with the Department of Health, the Department. There are some Medicaid laws that say that all medically necessary care must be provided, um, particularly for children. Like once something's been found to be medically necessary, it has to be provided. And we've been meeting with, the, with reasonable promptness, like quickly, not like two years later. Um, and so we've been meeting with the Department of Health and the Department of Disabilities, Aging, and Independent Living, and Medicaid. Medicaid pays for it, but it's sort of administered by Dale for adults and for Department of Health for children. We've been meeting with them, and they admit that they are violating the law. And in other states, there's been lawsuits about this, and courts have found that the state has to has violated the law and has to fix it. Um, so there, there's. Um, State Vermont's not sugarcoating their failure to meet their responsibility. Um, the, in this work, um, they've done some things to improve things, sort of like to help. Like I, I don't want to say nibble around the edges because for the families that it's helped, it's been very helpful. But we're still staying around 50 to 60 percent of the hours that are allocated on average getting provided. Um, so uh, we've met with home health. You know, those folks are trying hard. There, there's no doubt they're trying hard. There's, a, there's some administrative barriers. There's a pay gap between what the high-tech nurses are getting and what the home health nurses are getting. The high-tech nurses are getting the same as the home health nurses, but there's a pay gap between that and the hospital. And, at the hospitals have a nursing shortage, but their nursing shortage is about a 9% vacancy rate. This is like 40 to 50% of the hours are not getting filled. It's not the same, and it's because the pay gap is 
you know, Jill and I were talking about how much the pay gap is. Is it an $8 pay dollar, $8 an hour pay gap, $10 an hour pay cap, $6 an hour pay cap? It's a big pay gap when you're at that amount. So we think there needs to be a pay increase. State doesn't think there needs to be a pay increase. We think the state is not dealing with, with the urgency because today they are violating the law. Today they are not helping these families in the sufficient amount. So understanding that probably not going to get a pay increase, an uh, enhanced pay rate this year, even though we believe that's part of what's necessary, we at least need the state to be reporting to the legislature about what they're doing to fix the problem. They have an idea that they can fix the problem through payment reform that they have not yet defined or explained, which we have high doubts that if there's not enough money that moving the money around is going to fill the gap. Um, so the language that we're asking for is that you tell the, these parts of the state to work, work back to you in October what they've done to fix it and that they treat it with the urgency that it deserves. It's their responsibility to ensure that all medically necessary care is provided. And we are asking you to have them tell you what to do. And, and um, I think some of you have been contacted by some of these families. I have a, I mean, so you guys have too much going on. But I have a three and a half minute video from one family that explains their life. And you can see the kid in the high tech care. I have testimony from two families that came to the budget testimony. I can forward this to you, or you could also just say, mm, you know, honestly, that's just not going to be looked at right now. Or you could just believe me uh, that um, it's urgent and they are um, compelling in their disappointment. And, you know, it's not, it's not fair for us not to be, it's not fair, it's not safe, it's more expensive when they go to hospitals, and it's also um, against Medicaid law. So I'm asking you, to ask for a report from the state on how they're trying to fix this problem. Thank you. And I did want, I was actually going to acknowledge, but you've already said such, that uh, you had asked if you, you could share a video. I, 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 have, I viewed the video. Um, it, frankly, it's compelling. Uh, it I have family who are in virtually identical situation, uh, so I, it's very familiar and very, uh, you know, the situation is one of complete exhaustion for the parents who are having to do the care uh, for a great deal of the time. And it's a high level of care. It's not just a casual care. Um, but um, but I, I did ask not to, not to yeah, do that yeah. this morning. And um, I still feel comfortable with that. But I'm happy to have you share that with uh, committee members, forwarded to committee members for people they can do it on their own. <laughs> Is it better for me to forward it Yes, that uh, works. Okay, yeah, I'll do work. that. And the two pieces of um, the two pieces of testimony that people did at uh, um, at the uh, appropriations budget hearing. Yeah, you can work but, with work yeah. them to do that. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Okay. Um, people have questions. Yes, yeah, I have questions for Mark. So, so is this primarily a, a a staffing issue? Like there aren't enough people to do the work? Or is it an organizational problem that we're not getting people to the right spot? I, I, so I think that um, that's complex. There's a, a big part of it is obviously the nursing shortage. It's also hard if you're getting paid less than what you could do elsewhere. Um, there's some administrative barriers. I think that the administrative barriers aren't the biggest problem. Uh, I think that the pay rate is one of the... the you need to fix both, but if you don't fix the pay rate, you're not going to get people to do it. Um, uh, I think, you know, Jill Olson might disagree with me on that, um, but it, it, the state has to fix it, and they can figure out how to fix it, but they, we started talking to them about it in December of 2018, and we've had, like, this much improvement. And for those families, that improvement matters, but what about the rest? Um, at the very top of your document you have, you said, yep, yeah, at the top of the document it says 20 Medicaid eligible children and 25 adults. So that's the group of people that are in this category. Yeah. And it switches all the time. Yeah. Sometimes people die and new people come in. But it's a fixable problem. Right. We can fix this problem. I mean, I mean presumably we're not talking 
massive amounts of money as far as no. a pay increase. And, okay. And then so the, I think the pay increase is about to would cost if all the hours were filled, mm -hmm. the pay increase would be about four hundred and sixty thousand dollars. If it is a ten dollar gap, if it's less as Jill says, then it would be less than that. And what you said it's high tech nursing. Is it the same license, but? Yes. The responsibilities are different? Um, it, the, it's sometimes called high-tech nursing, sometimes it's called medically complicated, medically complex nursing. It's typically people who like are doing <clears throat> intubation, tube feeding, chest, mm -hmm. it's like if you see the video, you see the amount of technology that these families are dealing with in the home, but it's really medically complex care. It's, you know, <laughs> families are doing it and they don't have any you know, nursing license level, but uh, most people are using RNs. RNs. Mostly, not all of them are RNs, but mostly what the home health agencies are sending is RNs. Which would be the same level for other home health care. That it, it, I think the they same use some license things, level. I think depending on what you're getting, sometimes you get an LPN and sometimes you get an RN, depending on what's going on for you in, in your um, other care. <coughs> So let me let me step in again. We have, uh, as not just our committees, but many people working with the state are under enormous pressure yeah, to deal with other issues. Uh -huh. uh, Jay Samuelson is here from the ABC Human Services. I'm not going to ask you to comment at this time, but I will invite you to. We will share this language. Uh, Jenny needs to go be part of a COVID-19 planning yeah. meeting. And we respect that and uh, appreciate your being here to listen. Uh, and we will share the language and we'll invite your comments from the agency uh, before Friday as well. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, a lot of. Yeah, yeah. A lot, I'm good. A lot of moving parts. I'm good. I appreciate yeah. you guys got a lot going on and given me five minutes, which I think I managed to stretch to 10, is very much appreciated. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Jill, do you wish yes, to comment? I do. Briefly. <clears throat> Good morning, I'm Jill Olson. I'm the Executive Director of the VNAs of Vermont, uh, representing Home Health and Hospice. This is also a service provided by um, Biota Home Health, which uh, we don't represent, but we've been working closely with them on this issue. Um, so I just want to say first, I don't have any objection to this language. So if you want to have a report back, that's fine with us. Um, we've been working really hard on this issue for a very long time. It is a very complex problem. Um, and um, it's really hard to find nurses who actually want to do this work, uh, particularly the overnight shifts. It's, it's also stressful and tiring for them, and there just aren't that many nurses who, when there's so many nursing opportunities available, want to choose that particular form of nursing. So that's part of what we're, we're struggling with. And we're trying to address the nursing workforce shortage in other manners, I think. Exactly. We're aware that everyone through the Rural Services Task Force is fully aware that there is not a, there's a shortage, not an excess of yeah. applicants for nursing positions. Yeah, I wanted to just put a few things into context. So all of home health, it has a pay differential with all of hospital, right? So we are just a lower paid industry than hospitals. Mm -hmm. Um, the high tech and the home health uh, nurses have similar um, pay in our agencies. There is some differential based on a, our last wage survey. There's a lot of uh, federal regulation about how we can compare wages. There are legal ways to do it. We do them every two years, so we're waiting for another survey. But the differential with hospitals is true across our entire industry. Um, we, uh, as a, uh, an association, put together a task force uh, it's almost three years ago now. Um, we had families. I've met with these families. I've been to their homes. We had all of the departments in. We had Biata. So we, we did a lot of work, and we identified a series of policy solutions um, that we actually thought would have an impact on families. And as Barb mentioned, they really have. Um, so we've really been trying to find all the policy levers that we can pull, including um, more self-managed because families can actually pay more than we can because they don't have to. They don't have an overhead structure and they don't have the regulatory obligations that agencies have. We got that rate increased. Um, we have um, uh, Diva has now implemented a policy allowing family members who are nurses to pro to be paid to provide care for their family members, which has made a big difference for families who are not working. So it's only four families across the system. Ten percent of the families. So uh, small changes are actually significant. Um, and then the last thing I want to say, just to put $500,000 in context, to us, that's a lot of money. 
Our 2% increase last year with the global commitment match, $750,000 wiped out by our provider tax increase. So it's a lot of money to us um, and it's really hard to get across the hall. So I just need to put that in context because that's for our PCAs, all of our nurses, all of whom we need right now today as we're dealing with the crisis that we're in. So it's, it's, it does seem like a small amount of money. I wish it was across the hall because we would be getting our increases. Thank you. No, David, do you have a question? Yeah, I mean, this, so this is the problem. It looks like, based on the other testimony, that it <coughs> didn't start in 2018. Yeah. And I'm wondering whether if, the, if there were a half million or some other amount of money <coughs> necessary to raise wages by X number of dollars, would, would that even solve the problem? So would, would there be people yeah. willing to do the work for that? So my members think not. Is the, is the issue. So we've been asked the question by Diva, what's the number? And when I've asked that question of my members, they say, we don't know. We're not sh we can't identify one. There's no number that they feel like they could say would be the solution to the problem. Now, does that mean that more isn't better? More is always better. Um, but there isn't a particular sort of tipping point where we feel like we could say this problem could be solved. Nurses in a really uh, tight nursing market would be willing to spend eight hours overnight in the homes of some really complicated family situations. And the last increase we got, which was a very significant one back in 2014, did not have much impact on the, um, the availability of nurses in this field. So it's, it's a really complicated problem, uh, unfortunately. Yeah. I'll just, Frank. Right. Um, obviously, that has been going on for a little while. So wouldn't it have been better for this committee to have known about this situation in January rather than now? Um, I, 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 I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm not sure that this committee has uh, policy levers to, to do this work either. We've been working really hard on it internally. So I, I, um, it's, it's an ongoing problem for sure. I think we, we, could have had, we could have had more discussion on this. Right. I think that's a fair question, Brian. And I think that uh, there are numbers of issues, both from the, our advocacy around the budget, as well as any other uh, policy levers that or policy issues that we might have been able to bring to bear. I know it has been brought to our uh, to the attention of uh, Representative Houghton. Uh, on behalf of our committee in the last several weeks, but you're right, you know, we, we have not had the opportunity to look at this, and it, it, some people might question which committee's jurisdiction it falls under as well, so whether it's our committee or human services or certainly appropriations. I would also just say, because I, because uh, having, I want to acknowledge having viewed the video, I was like, uh, like I said, we have family who are in virtually the same situation in another state. Uh, and the level of exhaustion, the level, but mm -hmm. the, the, the need for respite is Correct. profound. Absolutely. Uh, family members are doing this. I, I would just, without at the risk of becoming a witness, I would just, I would suggest that perhaps some of the nursing care that is in fact being done by families does not require nursing uh, certification because in fact <coughs> family members are in fact providing that in the absence of a nurse in the home. And I think there is some, uh, uh, there may be some things that need to be looked at in terms of uh, reimbursing families for doing you know, what is in fact nursing care. When a family member does it, it's considered you can do it, but when someone else does it, it has to be a trained nurse, when in fact uh, appropriately trained individuals um, within the family are providing a great deal of this care. So that, and, that's and, absolutely and, true. And so I think yeah. it's a more complex issue than just saying, we need a pay raise for nurses, et cetera. Uh, I, I don't begin to understand all the complexities, but I appreciate you bringing yeah. attention. I think. Can I just put that one comment you just made in context? We are not allowed to hire non nurses to do that work. I, no, I understand. Federal so regulation. No, not, well, we've been asked that question. No, I, Federal regulation does not yeah, allow. No, I, I understand yeah. that, but yeah. I think okay. from, from a yeah. really from a on the ground yes. point of view, when you don't have nurses in the home, the family Absolutely. ends mm -hmm. up doing what would have been the nursing care. That is absolutely everything, right. Everything from, uh, everything that's required. Yes, Someone absolutely. Someone requires 24-hour care, can do nothing for themselves. Yes. I mean, absolutely nothing. 
any assistance with every bodily function. And that is what's going on. Uh, I think Thank so you. We, will, we will look at the language, we'll forward it to the other stakeholders, uh, we'll ask for feedback, uh, and we'll consider it as a piece of the miscellaneous health care bill that we're looking at. Thank you so much. Good. Um, let's then turn our attention to a different issue uh, having to do with uh, if we looked at House Bill, I think it's 505, is it? around supplemental um, Medicare policies. Um, I had asked David to look at, look at this a little bit further ourselves. We, I've, I've drawn the conclusion that we're not going to be able to move that bill this year. We've taken some testimony, but we do want, uh, there are many of us in the committee who are very interested, and I want to ask Emily Brown from the Department of Financial Regulation um, to join us, and I think so my, my request as a chair of the committee um, to ask the Department of Financial Regulation, which has oversight of all insurance policies in the state, um, whether DFR would be in the position to help us assess the complexities of implementing what, in fact, uh, is the proposal in H505, which I believe I quickly see, I'll try to summarize and then uh, help me if I don't have it, which is to create an additional open enrollment period for supplemental uh, Medicare policies. Um, and that raises, if a person has not signed up for the supplemental policy upon enrollment in Medicare, and some questions about what happens if you're in a Medicare Advantage policy and then step out of that. Yeah. Um, but what what, I, what my hope would be is that BFR might be assist this committee in looking at that issue in the interim period, well, not interim period, in the period between when we leave and when we come back. Uh, our, our successor committee is formed next January uh, because I think there's some <coughs> level of interest that I don't think we're going to be able to address fully right. in the period of time we have. So with that, um, So I'm down DFR, um, and we'd be happy to do that. Um, it is uh, the market as it's currently structured has one open enrollment period um, that's available to individuals, so this would be changing it to expand that to an annual open enrollment. So I think what we could do is look at uh, what effect that would have um, on the current enrollment, the current premiums potentially, and um, how that would also interact with other products available like Medicare Advantage. Um, so. okay. Is there anything that you would need from us in order to have that move forward so that we could have any, some confidence that we'll, we would actually, I mean, not that we'd question whether you do it, but yeah. would, it be helpful, would it be helpful to have this committee uh, either include some language or to maybe have some communication officially with the FR yeah, asking, asking to uh, assist us with Yes, this. I think that would help, whether it was um, in a formal, you know, something in the bill or uh, a letter that would, that would definitely help to give us guidance on what you'd like us to look at. Okay. Is it possible for you to implement it? Uh, yes. Without us yep. being in session and um, as a rule or? Well, so if we were to have that implemented as, it, as is written in 505, um, our regulation would need to be changed. We have a, a Medicare supplement regulation that would have to be amended. Um, I'm not, it could potentially have an impact on um, statutory language as well. Um, right now, the requirement for community rating um, is in um, Title VIII, so we have to look at that as well. So there are a few pieces that um, I think would, we would have to look at to figure out, okay, what changes need to be made. And, um, so in essence, it would probably have to go through the legislature? I, I believe it would, okay. yeah. Well, let me, that, that, let me, Anna Marie, I appreciate your question because I know that, again, there's some real, real interest on the part of some of us on this. Um, <laughs> We're, of course, trying, we're thinking initially in terms of coming up against our crossover deadline of Friday. Uh, but assuming we don't leave the building for other reasons uh, early, uh, is it realistic or would it be realistic for DFR to provide us with some preliminary analysis of this before 
when he uh, adjourned oh, this yeah. year. Definitely. So that, in fact, yeah. uh, should there be, should that analysis suggest that maybe with some work between uh, the Senate and the House, even post crossover, that there might be, if there's a, if the analysis suggests that we move forward, maybe there is a way for us to do something or at least review that possibility sure. before the end of the session. Yeah. That would, that I, I, would, I would ask if that could be done. Okay. Then that would allow us the mm -hmm. option of um, potentially you know, finding a way uh, with bills that are moving or other avenues to look at whether we can do something in this period. Okay. Help us understand what the pros and cons are, what what the statutory okay. changes would be required. Okay, we can do that. Thank okay. oh, you. That, that would be very helpful. Okay. So I want to do a letter to that. But. Okay. <laughs> so, so timeline or. Uh, um, let's talk offline. Okay. Let's talk offline good. about that. Okay. But, uh, that would about what's realistic for your office's work and what what would. Be required for us to actually have time to look at something. Okay, that Good. sounds great. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I think with that, uh, as I said, I think we're going to then take a break and we're going to work. The affordability work group is going to convene. Uh, I think the workforce group can uh, convene to have some conversation further with Jen. I think that's the best probably immediate use of that. I know Lori has some other things in anticipation tomorrow that she's going to be working on. Um, I have some requests for some other committee members to work on a couple of items to help us move forward. So with that, let's take a break. And uh, we'll reconvene at 10.30, start at 10.30, and look at the prior authorization language and hear those sentences before we, can, before we drop, before we stop. Are there any other questions from committee members? Clear what we're. What we're going to come back. Ten to thirty. Okay. To start the prior authorization testing. Okay. Oh, and Brian, uh, just I did admit that Brian is out today. I spoke. To Okay, I think we're going to reconvene the committee, and I think a lot got done during the break, so I think that was a good choice. Um, and we're going to turn our attention to the issue of prior authorization. And I'm going to turn it over to Representative Hogan to walk us through this part of the agenda. Great. Yes. Um, so we left this, uh, I don't know when, a week or two ago, um, asking the stakeholders to come back with some language. So we have that language now, thanks to everyone's efforts, as well as Jen. So Jen's going to walk us through it, and then we can um, get the stakeholders. Great. Regular Senate Council. Um, so this is prior authorization language. It has not been edited, so I want to just flag that. Um, so this has a number of provisions relating to prior authorization. The first one, and they're just lettered A through E because I don't know where they'll end. Um, first section would amend an existing statute on prior authorization that would direct a health plan to review the list of medical procedures and medical tests for which it requires prior authorization at least annually and shall eliminate the prior authorization requirements for those procedures and tests for which such a requirement is no longer justified or for which requests are routine, routinely approved with such frequency as to demonstrate that the prior authorization requirement does not promote health care quality or reduce health care spending to a degree sufficient to justify the administrative cost to the plan. And then the health plan must attest to DFR and the Green Mountain Care Board annually by September 15th that it has completed the review and appropriate elimination of <coughs> prior authorization requirements as required. So I'm going to stop for any questions on that. Okay. A, health, uh, a health plan would include health. it's so it's a defined term yep. earlier in the statute, but it's basically the health insurance plans. Private, right, care. Right, right, private health insurance. And just to be clear, there's no report to our committee or any other committee. This is this is data that they're going to use. Right. Okay. All right. 
The second section is a prior authorization um, report. This would say that by January 15th, DFR in consultation with health insurers and healthcare provider associations would report to this committee, Senate Health and Welfare and Senate Finance and the Green Mountain Care Board, opportunities to increase the use of real-time decision support tools embedded in electronic health records to complete prior authorization requests for imaging and pharmacy services, including options that minimize costs for both health care providers and health insurers. Section C uh, is a report on prior authorization in the context of the health care model. This would direct the Green Mountain Care Board in consultation with DIVA, the ACOs, payers participating in the all-payer model, healthcare providers, and other interested stakeholders to evaluate opportunities for and obstacles to aligning and reducing prior authorization requirements under the all-payer model as an incentive to increase scale, as well as potential opportunities to waive additional Medicare administrative requirements in the future. And that report, uh, the, the results of the evaluation would be submitted to this committee and the Senate committees by January 15th. Section D, also by January 15th, each health insurer with more than 1,000 covered lives in this state for major medical health insurance must implement a pilot program that automatically exempts from or streamlines certain prior authorization requirements for a subset of healthcare, participating healthcare providers, some of whom shall be primary care providers. Um, this exemption or streamlining is, is sometimes called gold carding, so I put that in the section heading, but not actually in the language. Each insurer must make available electronically, including on a publicly available website, details about its prior authorization, exemption, or streamlining program, including the medical procedures or tests that are exempt from or have streamlined prior authorization requirements for providers who qualify for the program, the criteria for healthcare provider to qualify for the program, the number of healthcare providers who are eligible for the program, including their specialties and the percentage who are primary care providers, and whom to contact for questions about the program or about determining a provider's eligibility for the program. And then by January 15, 2022, each health insurer who was required to implement the program uh, pilot would report to this committee, the Senate committees, and the Green Mountain Care Board the results of the pilot program, including an analysis of the costs and savings, prospects for the insurer continuing or expanding the program, feedback the insurer received about the program from the healthcare provider community, and an assessment of the administrative costs to the health insurer of administering and implementing prior authorization requirements. <coughs> and finally, whoops, and I codified this that I shouldn't have. This would just be another report. Um, this would say that on or before September 30th of this year, the Department of Vermont Health Access would provide findings and recommendations to the FIS committee, the Senate committees, and the Green Mountain Care Board <coughs> regarding prior authorization requirements in the Vermont Medicaid program, including a description and evaluation of the outcomes of the prior authorization waiver pilot program for Medicaid beneficiaries attributed to the Vermont Medicaid Next Generation ACO model. For each service for which Vermont Medicaid requires prior authorization, the denial rate for prior authorization requests and the potential for harm in the absence of a prior authorization should say requirement. Um, B, based on information provided under subdivision A, the services for which the department would consider waiving the prior authorization requirement, the results of the department's current efforts to engage with healthcare providers and Medicaid beneficiaries to determine the burdens and consequences of the Medicaid prior authorization requirements and the providers and beneficiaries' recommendations for modifications to those requirements, the potential to implement systems that would streamline prior authorization processes for the services for which it would be appropriate for the focus on reducing the burdens on providers, patients, and the department, which state and federal approvals would be needed in order to make proposed changes to the Medicaid prior authorization requirements, Opportunities to expand the pilot program created pursuant to 33 BSA section 1999F 
to exempt prescribers from the prior authorization requirement of the preferred drug list program if the provider meets certain compliance standards and the potential for aligning prior authorization requirements across payers. Thank you, Jen. Any questions for Jen? Is there any mechanism in this process for adding new things to prior authorization? Uh, I don't know that there's anything in this process, but I think that's something that I think that's something that the providers subject to our existing laws already have the authority to do. Thank you, Jeff. Jessa Barnard with the Vermont Medical Society, and thank you to the committee for giving us a couple weeks to work on this. I think um, it's really come together. It's, uh, to me, this work has highlighted that administrative burden is multifaceted and we can't solve it with one approach. So while in some ways this is a little, the gold card piece of what we started with a couple weeks ago has been a little bit narrowed in scope in general, I think actually it's a lot broader in scope and is looking at a number of ways in which we can reduce administrative burden on providers, which is what I really like about where this has landed um, because gold carding may solve the issue or reduce the issue for some providers. It doesn't address other issues like alignment between payers or opportunities to uh, expand programs under all payer model or increase alignment under all payer. So I think I feel really positive and encouraged about where this is going and the, the collaborative work with all the folks involved on this. So we are very supportive. Um, Jen really walked through the details, so I don't know that I need to repeat much of what she said. I'll just say that um, one of the pieces that um, is sort of new is the, the piece about um, is Section B um, under the electronic health records and what that um, that is a so those are electronic tools that basically embed the prior authorization process in the provider's electronic health record so that while you're documenting the diagnosis or what you're ordering it sort of automatically um, can also process whether a PA is needed or give you that approval sort of embedded within your um, EHR and what I think is so promising about that is there are areas where we may have less opportun fewer opportunities either all under all payer or through gold cards to waive prior authorization, for example, around pharmacy. Um, I think at least for the foreseeable future, we're probably going to have pharmacy prior authorization, and this is a way that it, it streamlines that administrative burden on the provider for doing it. We know there are costs associated with that to providers. They may have to um, update their EHRs, so that may be something that's only able to be sort of rolled out over time but I, hopefully this will give us some more information about what those opportunities and um, costs may be under Section B. Um, the gold card pilot we're also um, excited about. So uh, the intent is to basically capture, for example, what Blue Cross is already doing. They just told you about a couple weeks ago their new program, so that would, for example, count as one of these pilots um, and then asking other payers to do that as well and report back what they're learning from that and if that gives them opportunities to expand gold card further. And then um, I'm really, uh, I really appreciate the work with Diva on the report they're doing because that's going to look at their, all the waiver they're doing and I think you can hear more from them um, under the all payer model and taking what they learn from that to both see whether they can expand that waiver or expand their existing gold card program. So you may, they have a, a pretty small gold card program now, but as they learn kind of where the costs and benefits of prior authorization are, they are open to taking that information to inform expansions of their gold card program. So um, again, from the provider perspective, it's, you know, it's definitely a number of steps in the right direction to get us the information we need and, and try to start reducing some of the administrative burden. Thank you. Happy any to answer questions? any questions. Um, I guess I was curious if you could talk a little more. I know the original proposal, one of the reasons why it was appealing to providers was that they wouldn't have to be dealing with a different system for each insurer. 
with the original original proposal of the 90% approval rating, you know, one of the like I, my impression was that one of the reasons it was appealing was that providers would know whether or not they were gold carded without having potentially a different answer for each. Is that I, so I don't think that's necessarily the case, which okay. is one of the limitations of a gold card program, at least the way we've been thinking about it or talking about it with this committee before, is that we always intended that each payer could come up with their own gold card program. So then you okay. could still end up with three, four, or five gold card programs. And so you may qualify under one, but not another, or certain types of providers or procedures may be exempt under one, but not another. So that's actually where some of these elements came in around alignment is that that's only, that only goes so far to help. If you're exempt for one payer but not the other three or four that you work with regularly, it actually that may not help reduce your overall work. That's very hard to integrate into your workflow because then each right. time you need to figure out which insurer the patient has and if you're exempt or not. And um, So that's kind of actually one of the things that I think diva has been learning over time and One Care has been learning with their pilot waiver is that depending how you structure it, um, if it's just as hard to verify whether you qualify for the waiver, it's not really reducing your administrative burden. So how can we um, really try to get the, the payers as aligned as possible? Um, and I think a gold card program may be more limited in that regard than looking at which directions can we go under the all payer waiver, which already, and you hear from the Green Mountain Care Board, but already requires, or the CMS already wants the state to be looking at alignment okay. um, and reporting on opportunities for alignment under the program. So, you know, again, it's not a it's not a one size fits all solution. There are a number of different components of this kind of getting at the issue from different angles. So just just because this language mm -hmm. is I think somewhat new to all mm -hmm. of us, can you point can you help me see where in the language it's talking about alignment and or just kind yes. of help point me to Sure, the yeah. So the, um, there are a couple places under section C that's um, asking the Green Mountain Care Board to consult with the ACO, payers, healthcare providers, and other stakeholders and evaluate opportunities for aligning and reducing prior authorization requirements under the all payer model, as well as potential opportunities to waive additional Medicare administrative mm -hmm. requirements. Okay. Um, so you, again, you can hear more from the board, but they already, my understanding is they already do a, some alignment assessment and this would kind of be building off of that specifically around prior authorization and whether we look to DIVA's waiver as a model or other models of how can we um, either waive or streamline prior authorization requirements. Um, and then the other, it's also mentioned actually under DIVA's report a little bit too is looking at um, so that's section E looking at their current waiver under um, so it's asking them to provide a description and evaluation of the outcomes of their prior authorization waiver pilot program under the next gen ACO model and then at the towards the end um, they reference potential for aligning prior authorization requirements across payers under seven. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, so this this gold card pilot program in this language is no, it's not a step, is it true that it's not a step backwards from the original 90% gold card proposal as far as the alignment specifically is concerned? I think that yes, I mean, I guess I would say it would, if it had truly been a 90%, that and, it, and at least what the payers testified is that that's a large number of their pr providers. Okay. So truly, if you exempt most providers from all from prior most. authorization, uh -huh. from all payers, then that would be consistent. Okay. But I think we heard that that's really not feasible at this time. So if you're looking at small, what most gold cards are, are a much smaller percent exempt. Um, you know, really gold carding is to get at the highest performing, you could call it, providers who are approved at a very, you know, whatever it is, maybe 98% um, rate. So maybe you're, you're getting at 5, 10, you know, percent of your providers who qualify. So if it's a small percent or sort of the top performing only, and then plans are developing their kind of own pilots or own programs to look at it, you could get a different five or 10% and under each of those programs, and then you don't have a alignment. Okay. 
That's really helpful for understanding. Yeah, 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 sure. Any other questions for Jessa? Great, thank you. Sure, thank you. So now that we want to cut anyone short, but there is another meeting happening at 11.30, so we'll need to be done a couple minutes before that. Um, so just be aware of that with the number of people that we have testifying. Good morning, uh, Alicia Cooper, Director of Payment Reform, Reimbursement, and Rate Setting for the Department of Vermont Health Access. Uh, DIVA is supportive of the language as just reviewed, and we wanted to use our testimony this morning to provide a little bit more context for the reporting that was described for DIVA in Section E of the legislation that has been drafted. In 2017, DIVA executed a contract with OneCare Vermont for the Vermont Medicaid Next Generation ACO program. We've had the opportunity to talk a bit about that program with this committee in the past. Uh, today I'll speak specifically about the waiver of prior authorization within that program. <coughs> because our contract with OneCare stipulated that DIVA would pay OneCare an agreed upon price for the cost of medical care for attributed Medicaid members, and because the network of ACO providers was assuming financial risk for services in a way that providers had not assumed risk previously, DIVA and OneCare agreed at that point in time to begin testing a waiver of prior authorization for those services for attributed members. The goals of doing so were to reduce administrative burden for providers and practices, and to empower providers to follow best clinical practice and to determine appropriate care for their patients without that additional layer of payer review. As a result, we began our waiver of prior authorizations in 2017, which was the first year of our ACO contract. Uh, as it was constructed in this first year, three criteria had to be in place in order for the waiver of prior authorization to be in effect. Uh, the first was that a provider had to be participating in OneCare's network. The second was that the Medicaid member had to be attributed to the ACO. And the third was that the service was one for which the ACO was assuming that financial accountability. As we were implementing this in 2017, we learned from the ACO and their network of providers that this approach had a number of limitations. And the most pronounced limitation at that time was that uh, having the waiver of prior authorization only available to providers that were participating in the ACO's network meant that there were implications for referral patterns. Uh, as you may recall, in 2017, the Medicaid program had four provider communities participating. And so to the extent a provider, for instance, in Burlington, wanted to do some sort of referral to a provider that was outside one of those four communities, they would still have to go through the prior authorization process in conjunction with the provider that would ultimately be performing that service. And so there wasn't necessarily that reduction in administrative burden comprehensively. It was very specific to the providers that would be performing the service. So with that feedback, uh, we made some adjustments to our prior authorization waiver for the 2018 performance year. And we broadened the criteria. So at that point in time, the only criteria that were in place were that the member had to be attributed to the ACO and that the service was part of the ACO's financial accountability. This, therefore, extended the waiver of prior authorization to every Medicaid enrolled provider, regardless of their participation in the ACO's network. Um, part of our interesting learning from 
going into this stage of our waiver um, was that when the waiver was specific to the ACO network of providers, we could work with the ACO on communication about what the waiver of prior authorization was and when it was in effect. As soon as it was available to all of our Medicaid providers, we had a lot of very skeptical providers who were hearing that a, a prior authorization wasn't necessary for a particular member and service. And, and they said, we don't, really? we don't believe you. <laughs> Can you send us a letter that says that we don't need it so that if your claim doesn't pay, we can come back to you with this. And so we had to do some um, more focused work in 2018 on broader provider education. Uh, I think that was ultimately successful, but, but it took a while for, for the whole scope of Medicaid providers to uh, understand how to interact with the waiver of prior authorization. Another thing that we looked at in 2018 was making a more clear distinction between prior authorizations for the purpose of traditional utilization management as payers um, will employ and the use of prior authorization to ensure that there's clinical review of requests that relate specifically to patient care and safety. Uh, the reason we wanted to have that conversation at that point in time as we were evolving our waiver of prior authorization is because at the end of the day, even though we're contracting with one care, DIVA continues to have responsibility for the care and safety of all of our Medicaid enrolled members regardless of their ACO attribution status. And so at this point in time, we made a few adjustments to our waiver of prior authorization whereby DIVA continued to perform clinical review for things that could result in adverse consequences for a member if that clinical review did not occur. And good examples of these are often in the area of complex durable medical equipment. Uh, so for instance, Medicaid requires prior authorizations when a Medicaid member needs a, a complex wheelchair, for example. If there isn't that level of clinical review in identifying which wheelchair is appropriate for the member and making sure that it's appropriately fitted to that specific member, there's the potential for someone to get an item or a piece of equipment that's not suited to them that could result in harm down the road. And so we do have, at this point in time, a few exceptions to our waiver of prior authorization that relate to these patient care and safety considerations. So we've continued to operationalize the waiver of prior authorization from 2018 through the present uh, with those modifications that were made in 2018. But we recognize that that's not the end of the road. Um, we've continued to hear feedback from providers that, and I think this was just mentioned in, in Jess's testimony, that while there is some benefit in having a waiver of prior authorization for an increasing number of Medicaid members, that doesn't help when a particular provider has some members in their panel who are attributed to the ACO and others who are not, because then their workflow has to contemplate consulting a list to know which member is attributed. They also have to know which services are eligible for the waiver of prior authorization and which aren't. And so as a result of that, DIVA is actively exploring payer level modifications to prior authorization requirements based on our learnings from the waiver of prior authorization through the ACO program. The goal would be we would move away from an ACO program specific waiver of prior authorization and toward a broader set of rules that are less restrictive than those that Medicaid has had in the past. And so that's the work that would be described in the report that is contemplated by Section E. And then on my last slide, I just have a quick summary. So in 2017, we had our more narrow definition. We've moved to a slightly broader definition for 2018 through 2020, and we're doing this analysis about how we could change authorizations going forward. 
the graph on the bottom of the slide shows, and I think this is helpful as well, the number of unique Medicaid beneficiaries for whom the waiver of prior authorization applies over time. So we are going from 2016, when we did not have a waiver in place, to 2020, where approximately 114,000 Medicaid beneficiaries have the waiver in place for them. So we do still have this waiver active through our ACO program, and it's affecting a pretty significant number of our Medicaid members. But in the meantime, we are looking to make some of those broader changes going forward. Great. Thank you. Can you just remind us uh, of the total number of Medicare beneficiaries? Medicaid. I'm sorry, Medicaid. Thank you. <laughs> Certainly. Um, I believe our total number, I don't want to tell you a number that's not right, but I believe the 114,000 who are attributed represent approximately 85% of our full Medicaid benefits membership. Anyone else? Thank you very much. Sarah. Good morning. Um, Sarah Teach out with Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Vermont. Um, and I, worked, I testified uh, several weeks ago on our um, provider passport program, and I worked with BMS and the others in this group to come up with this language and we support what you have now. Okay, thank you. Any questions? I know you're trying to. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> Yes, Susan Gretkowski, MVP Healthcare. Um, MVP can live with the language. <laughs> so, I would like to thank Representative Houghton for working with all the stakeholders to get us to this point. So thank you very yep. much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Here it is. Hi, Can make it shorter? <laughs> Susan Barrett, Executive Director of Green Mountain Care Board. I also support the language in the prior authorization, what is it, bill proposal. Um, and I just want to say that back in 2018, the board sent a letter to the legislature regarding administrative burden on providers and particularly focused on prior authorization. So um, we at the board want to thank you for taking up our request to look at this <coughs> and for making some proposals on this important issue. And so my board will be very happy to hear that this is being done. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Great. Thank you. Discussion? Okay. And I just want to say how absolutely ecstatic I am at the work you were able to lower. This has been such a high priority. Hmm? And, well, and everybody else. I, I mean, it, it has been such a high priority for me for so long in terms of all of the reasons. And I was at the point where I was quite discouraged because of the, you know, the conflict between us trying to say, do this, and other people doing other things, and, you know, never the twain shall meet, and you make them meet everyone uh, working together. So I'm just um, thrilled. Lucy? Um, yeah, I, I wanted to echo that. I'm very, very happy for all the work that's... <laughs> I'm very appreciative of all the work that's been done um, by Representative Houghton and the stakeholders and excited to hopefully move forward on something this year. I also, I think I just, I also want to express frustration that we're unable to move forward on something more complete. And I just wanted to share a reflection with the committee, which is um, we, Representative Houghton and I were forward, forwarded a memo that the University of Vermont Health Network had sent the Green Mountain Care Board in uh, last summer, where they tried to just capture, let's get a sense of the scale of how much time it's causing us to go through prior authorization. And they came up with the number just for the University of Vermont Health Network, not including other hospitals, not including um, physicians or providers who aren't with hospitals, that they retained 44 full-time equivalent employees for, <coughs> for prior authorization work. And that's on, the, that's on the hospital side of it. That's, you can imagine, maybe a reflection of a similar 
amount of time on the other side of it. And so I just did some very, very rough, not accurate, just very rough, like what's the order of magnitude of money we're talking about, making a guess at salaries and came up that we're in the range of just from the UVM Health Network side of it, we're in the range of a few million. I got four and a half million dollars. And just, I just wanted to put that number into context with the testimony we heard from Blue Cross Blue Shield that they think they save about seven to eight million dollars a year. So if we, if we double it and we say if that's on the UVM side, yeah. if that's on the UVM side, you know, if we double it and we say, okay, there's a person on both end, just through the UVM Health Network, we're talking the same order of magnitude as the money we're saving, and it just is deeply frustrating to me given our workforce issues that we have 44 full-time equivalents working on something that potentially is costing us more money and not saving us money. So I'm very appreciative of the step forward and also feel the need to express yeah. frustration that it's not a bigger step. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. Um, so let me just uh, speak to our own process for moving forward. It sounds like there's a support for the language of this proposal. Um, I think what I might might do at this point is simply ask for a straw poll of the committee for a support of this, and then we will come back to each each element. This would be one of the elements in what um, currently calling a miscellaneous health care bill from our committee to take to the floor. So uh, folks prepared and comfortable with doing a straw poll just to kind of be able to put that forward. So I would ask uh, for those who committee members present in the room who are uh, what, prepared to support this language as one element of the miscellaneous health care bill by show of hands. Okay, let the record show that all 10 members present uh, support the inclusion of this in a, uh, My hand is up. <laughs> <laughs> we can vote straw poll. It's straw, yeah, vote. straw poll, so it's unanimous. So it's all, all, all 11 members. <laughs> 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 The you, voice right. from the center. Okay. okay. And again, let me also uh, express my appreciation, uh, Lori, for helping to move this forward to all the stakeholders. Uh, and I think the uh, uh, we will we'll look forward to achieving the longer range goal, which Representative Rogers is clearly articulated as well. I think there's a high level. This, I would just reiterate from I think from the first day, practically, of becoming the chair of this committee. This has been a repeated uh, drumbeat of, uh, from providers. And when we talk about supporting primary care physicians, uh, there's the repeated and ongoing uh, plea to reduce administrative burdens. It's actually that, part of your burnout. Yes, yes. Yeah, so so we, we, we do uh, simultaneously acknowledge the uh, pressure uh, on the healthcare system and the need to move forward in a manner that uh, moves the whole system forward. So hopefully this this will uh, make a significant move forward. So with that, I'm going to, uh, let me just see. We have scheduled an 1130 meeting to take some next steps in, a, in the work group on the workforce. So I think, uh, I think if there's anything else that we need to do before we adjourn for the morning. Uh, uh, we're on the floor this afternoon. David will be doing third reading. Oh, I, oh, I know a couple of acknowledgments. Uh, there, at least one of our colleagues uh, reached out with some questions about uh, the, the uh, medical practice board bill. Lucy, thank you for doing some research. I uh, love David was working on something else. And we're going to do, give feedback to that member. Hopefully, that will not require some interrogation on the floor, some <laughs> unnecessary interrogation on the floor. Uh, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> asked if it was about the podiatrist. We were considering interrogating David to understand why it's the board of medical practice and podiatry. So <laughs> we figured we might let it go, but yeah, you, you, you might want to consider letting it go. <laughs> The chair has spoken. <laughs> <laughs> and Lori has the reading on, uh, on yeah. the uh, telehealth bill. Uh, so, you know. Just a two second report that we, um, the affordability, affordability group has made significant progress on the proposal to present. Uh, there's language that's being redrafted, and whenever we can fit it in our schedule, we can present that. Okay. 
And uh, let me again say, looking ahead to tomorrow's schedule in the same way that we have to modify today's schedule, I don't know that we'll post a revised agenda, but you just need to understand that we are going to be putting both the affordability issue back on the agenda. We're going to be uh, looking at other elements of the health care miscellaneous bill. Uh, we will be talking about some language on prescription drug data. And uh, we'll just do our best to uh, keep folks who are stakeholders of a particular group. We'll try to keep you advised, but you, I encourage you to stay in communication with us as well. We'll do our best to let you know what we're doing and how, but we have a lot to call, cover, a lot of ground to cover, and I think we'll cover it in the next few days. Um, okay, so let's adjourn for the morning.